are prone to becoming so attached to our characters and stories that we struggle to see why a passage may not be working. It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, shaping stories into masterpieces that can stand the test of time. Editing services are provided for all genres and all age categories. Services range from critiques of the short story through to the line edits of the full-length novel and copy editing for those preparing for publication. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's file for your website, as well as help with those book blurbs and promotional material. We won't abandon you to the masses. We want to celebrate with you and your successes. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services and prices, visit us at blackwolfeditorial.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course. Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. This Saturday is National Baby Back Ribs Day. You know, you're already maybe like three steps ahead by recognizing. Uh, He looks like a top five running back talent wise in the NFL period to me right now. Why does anybody care what Colin Kaepernick thinks about America. Let me, why do you care? We're socially connected, but we're also biologically connected. I want to at least think about wearing a sweatshirt before I can start really indulging myself in some of the great Oktoberfest beers out there. Friends, welcome back to Wen's World, Labor Day Weekend Edition. Fantasy football, food, beer, sex, and a whole lot more. Here we go! Yep, it's fantasy football time, and draft day is right around the corner for many of us. So I wanted to get the experts back in Wentz World with a show called Off the Record. You can subscribe to their YouTube channel, Nickel Press TV. With me now is Andy and Tay Hall. Welcome to Wentz World, guys. How you doing? Fabulous, sir. Thank you for I'm doing having wonderful. All right, so I want to get going here with some of the preseason performers that could possibly inspire you to go ahead and take them on Fantasy Draft Day. Andy, what are you saying about this? Oh, my guy absolutely right now has to be Kenny Stills. It is a, world, a wide receiver's world these days. Uh, Adam Gates coming to Miami. Mm. A lot of people thought Devontae Parker was going to be the uh, breakout wide receiver that Gates is known to produce, and Kenny Stills. Still only entering his fourth season, has looked every bit the part. Uh, he is a solid, full-dimensional wide receiver. He's not just a deep threat. I like Miami's passing attack. I like Tannehill a lot more than other people do. And uh, I like Kenny Stills. What he's doing in the preseason is showing me that I, I, I'm believing the proof is in the pudding there. So I am all in on Kenny Stills. I'm riding the golden pony. <laughs> Tay Hall, what about you? I'm big on Snead from I just like the Saints receiver. Snead and then Michael Thomas, the rookie, is the guy everybody's talking about. He's had a really nice preseason. He might kind of be their number two, three receiver. I know they have Cooks and then Snead, who I just mentioned, but Thomas is kind of could be kind of a a guy who lives up to the preseason performance. Also, Fuller, I would should mention for Houston. It looks like he's locked into a starting spot. The rookie, big play guy, probably not a guy you want to start weekly, but. Is probably going to have a couple big performances. That's good stuff. You know, this year there's a lot of talk about the wide receiver position taking precedence in the early going over your running back. So, are you guys buying into this, or do you think it's smoke and mirrors? Uh, absolutely buying into it. I also happen to think though this is the year to invest back into running backs early on in the draft. A lot of people are going away from that, following the trend, and uh, I think. You'll uh, be mistaken by taking that route. I still think this is a year you can bounce back to taking a running back in the first or second if the right one is there. I'm not saying by default just absolutely take a running back, right. but don't be afraid to as well is what I'm trying to say more than anything. What about you, Tay Hall? 
You know, I'm a little bit mixed on the on the subject. I wrote a little bit about this on my column the other day. With the, when PPR leagues, people are going with this thing. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with now the zero running back theory, where you're basically just waiting deep on running back and getting these guys that maybe catch the balls, but really not worrying about it. I like to still get a running back early there. I just, you know, it's all about for me just reading the draft board, who's there. You know, not necessarily absolutely sticking with a certain strategy, but wide receivers have definitely over the past few years gone way, way up. It used to be like, oh, you've got to go running back, running back with your Mm -hmm. first two picks. Those days are long gone. Receivers are full in the first round, are full of receivers in that standard half point PR, PPR and PPR. It's a ton of receivers. That's the world we live in Right. right now. And it might change, but not anytime soon. Yeah, I got burned last year. I went uh, Eddie Lacy and C.J. Anderson. Oh! Yeah. You know, and that was what everybody was talking about. You can't lose. It's a sure bet. And I sure as hell was out of luck last year. Yeah, that reminds me of uh, Trent Richardson two years ago. So that was a horrible uh, route you took last year with those two directions. (laughs) That's so true. Hindsight's always 20-20. Is it ever too early to take the best quarterback in the league? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, that's my personal feeling. I think you can wait on a quarterback. Uh, the reason being is their drop-off is so insignificant on a weekly basis. You're talking a mere couple points. Right. You know, you're talking about what a kicker is basically going to produce for you. So, uh, you know, that can be the difference between a win and a loss, sure. But if I'm drafting a monster team, I'm trying not to win based on two or three points being the difference. Right. Uh, so I think you can certainly wait on a quarterback. Uh, the quarterback's uh, there was a lot of talk about Derek Carr possibly finishing as a top five QB. He's my favorite guy last year. He's on my favorites list again this year. And the thing is, he could easily be between quarterback five and quarterback 15 at the end of the season. Hmm. And the difference really is going to be between, you know, less than 20 points separating those 10 guys. So that just kind of shows you the depth at that position. What about you, Tail? Yeah, I've never been a take a quarterback kind of high type of deal. The only time I ever really did is the year after Tom Brady tore his ACL. I can't took him, you know, higher than I normally would take a quarterback. That was a big year. He kind of struggled that year. Basically, cost me a title. I'll never go that route again. Although <laughs> I do get intrigued with the running quarterbacks. You know, like you know, Michael Vick. Basically, when he had that insane year for the Eagles, got me. Uh, very nice season. He went absolutely off. The next year, some of these guys were saying he should be the number one overall pick, and then he bricked. So, you know, the the running quarterbacks are kind of hit or miss because you don't know what's going to happen there as far as with the TDs and whatnot. But, yeah, like Andy said, the fall-off just isn't that big. Like, you know, I can get a guy like my boy Tyrod Taylor or something like that real deep in drafts like that, and he might end up, and he should end up being a top-ten quarterback regardless. So I'd focus those higher draft picks on the more important positions. And go from there. So maybe not uh, not until the fourth, fifth, maybe even as late as the sixth round? Yeah. Yeah, I don't uh, have a problem with like a Russell Wilson maybe in the fourth, fifth, sixth right. round, something like that, because I think he's going to have an absolutely monster season, but that's just my kind of personal preference. But, yeah, you know, Drew Brees is always as safe as it gets. You know, these guys, Aaron Rodgers, these guys are very safe. You're, yeah. you're comfortable when you have a guy like that, but I still think you're better off taking a receiver or a running back with one as high as you have to take those guys i'm going receiver or running back all day i never make that move i would say even the fourth or fifth is is way too soon probably double that and wait till you know eight nine ten rounds uh, range before you start looking at your quarterbacks and even if you back you know go back to back rounds with them at that point you're still going to wind up with at least one serviceable guy on a weekly basis so you guys were talking about running quarterbacks earlier, and the name that came to my head was Dak Prescott. There's a lot of preseason mm. hype about him, specifically given Romo's injury. He's going to be starting probably for the first several weeks of the year. Do you feel like this this guy may be a good pick down the line, maybe a seventh, eighth, ninth round? Or? You know, that's, that sounds a tad too high for me. I am leaning towards more that this guy is going to have a fantasy impact than not. I'm kind of leaning towards maybe, you know, this could either be something real special. It could be a total dead. I'm leaning towards special. I think this guy's kind of got what it takes to be a star. Is Dak's squad right now, I think he's going to go up. I think he's going to surprise. He can run. He can throw a bit. I think this is gonna, I think he's a special guy, I believe. Andy, what do you think about that? Yeah, I got a lot to say about Dak, actually. Uh, just real quick on Tony Romo. We have a renowned orthopedic surgeon from Duke University fame, Dr. Salim Parekh, who uh, joined us weekly on Off the Record. And 
his take on Romo, and I have to agree with him, is that he might not be back, period, mm. uh, for his career. So uh, I, I kind of lean towards that. As far as Dak Prescott goes, you know, it really depends on what league you're in. You're going to be in half the leagues that think that this guy is worth, you know, investing a high pick in, and then others that don't believe in him. I'd prefer to be in a league that doesn't believe in him mm. because I certainly do. This guy was, you know, an SEC quarterback, uh, led his team to number one in the nation at one point when really had limited options. So it was really him putting the weight of the program on his shoulders. I see a lot of Russell Wilson when I uh, watch Dak Prescott play. Uh, he looks poised. He looks comfortable. He's got veteran receivers uh, surrounding him and Des Bryant and Jason Witten that, you know, are, are solid uh, receiving threats. That It's not just, you know, he's got to be pinpoint accurate on deep routes or something like that for these guys to be successful. These guys are massive targets. That is a, a beautiful security blanket for him. Plus, you got that offensive line, as you alluded to, that's really paving the way for this to be a run-first offense with, you know, prize first rounder Ezekiel Elliott. So mm. uh, there's a lot of things that Dak is not going to have to do, and he's really just going to have to play the script that's prepared for him. It's going to be limited at first, but he's shown that he can handle that. And I think a lot of people uh, wrote him off based on his draft position, but he, uh, he certainly, you know, he, he's not an unknown if you uh, are into college football. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Well, you mentioned Zeke Elliott. Do you guys feel as if he's going to be the breakout rookie of 2016? He's obviously going higher than any other rookies in the draft, and I think for good reason. He mm-hmm. looked great against the Seahawks here, barreling over Cam Chancellor, the big dog, the best strong safety in the league, the hardest hitter there is. And if he's going to be doing all that, he's going to get off. That offensive line is filthy. He's going to get to the linebackers and defensive backs a lot and going to be able to take them on. He's a three-down back. He's a good receiver. I think he's going to absolutely kill it. I mean, injuries are kind of the only thing that can stop him. And then, you know, he's made a couple questionable decisions off the field, so that could come into play. Hmm. But as far as just talented running, he looks like a top five running back talent-wise in the NFL, period, to me right now. Wow, that's big time. So, Tehal, you're saying first or second round worthy? or? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, first round. What about you, Andy? Yeah, I, I think this guy's got the weight of the world on his shoulders based on where he was drafted, his pedigree at Ohio State the Cowboys offensive line, the Tony Romo injury, and at every turn and every additional thing that's been added to his workload, he has not shown any signs of weakness or being incapable of living up to those expectations. So I full well believe in him as well. I actually just drafted him in uh, one of my home leagues. I was able to snag him at the eighth spot in the first round. So I'm totally a believer in Ezekiel Elliott going forward. And again, if you're just joining us, we are with Andy and Tayhall of Off the Record. You can find them on YouTube. Subscribe ASAP. Nickel Press TV on Twitter at People's Pen, P E O P L E Z P E N. That's where you can find my man Andy. And of course, Tayhall on Twitter as well at Lord Bedict, L O R D B E D D I C T. Guys, as we wrap things up, I kind of want to touch on your feelings about the best QB and wide receiver tandem. And also, which ones to avoid at the same time? Uh, I'm going to take this back to the guy I mentioned earlier being one of my favorites, and that's Derek Carr. I see this offense as sort of a uh, modified version of what the Packers do out in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, He's got Amari Cooper, who made Blake Sims look like a Hall of Famer in college. (laughs) This guy is going to totally take off in his second year. He's he's just a a stud, and uh, I like that combination. There are a few others that that I – you know, like as well, but I'm going to go with the dark horse being uh, the Raiders, Carter Cooper. And what does the great Tay Hall say? I'm going to go with, you know, the most obvious choice, Big Ben to Antonio Brown here. Mm-hmm. These are two absolute legends. You could argue Antonio Brown's going number one overall in all fantasy drafts. You could argue that Big Ben is the best quarterback in the NFL, definitely top three or four. Everybody is on board with that, so I got to go with them. That's the safest choice. I'm not normally known for my safe comments or <laughs> predictions but in this case i'm gonna take the safe route all right so andy and tay hall who has made you do a 180 in terms of how you feel about them either positive or negative so uh i personally am very into the, the nfl draft i attend the senior bowl uh january's down in mobile alabama uh so in leading up to this year i was very down on derrick henry uh translating his game into the pros I am not prepared to eat crow on this sentiment. I was vastly intrigued by the Titans' opening snap of the preseason in which they featured DeMarco Murray 
and Derrick Henry both in the backfield at the same time. Wow. They've yet to do it again, but that just showed me that this is something that's in the playbook. And if we see that in the regular season, uh, I, I think it's just going to be something defensive we'll not be able to prepare for. Uh, and so far as a runner, he's looked, he's looked to be capable of running through NFL-level linebackers, which I thought was going to be his big problem. I just didn't think he, as big and strong as he is, I, I just thought he would be equally matched as a pro as opposed to just being able to run over everybody like he did in college. So I have changed my tune on Derrick Henry as we enter the season. What about you, Tejal? A guy uh, that people are having to sell me on the kind of – I've kind of come around here on the last couple of weeks. I do rankings at Fantasy Pros and for Rasball, and I get – kind of harassment that I had Lamar Miller too low. Of course, he's been in Miami the first, the last few years of his career, his whole career, really. And now he's in Houston to kind of be the lead back. Now he doesn't really have to split carries. Now he's no goal line back. He's the guy. Explosive. He's fast. People are kind of thinking this guy might be a top five back. I was like, yo, hold up, hold up here a little <laughs> bit. Rain in the horses here. This is getting out of control. He has never showed us what we kind of thought he could do before. Is it really all Miami's coach's fault? Or is some of this, like, does he have some deficiencies we don't know about or we're not seeing? There's got to be a reason for this, but there's really no competition for him there. Offense looks good right now. Stuff looks good. I'm kind of come around to him. He's definitely probably a top 10 back, possibly a top 5 back. It's hard for me to admit my wrongs, but I was maybe incorrect on this one, and I'm kind of leaning towards him having a monster year. Man, I appreciate the vulnerability there. Again, if you just joined us, we've been with Andy and Tay Hall. Off the record, the name of their show. Subscribe on YouTube, Nickel Press TV. Tay Hall is also a contributor to Razball.com. You can get your fantasy insights and advice there. These guys, you guys have been brilliant, man. Thank you so much, gentlemen. we got to have you back next week. We'll look back on some of these statements and look ahead toward week two in the NFL. Sounds good. Looking Thank you, sir. Friends, stick with us right after this break. We are back with our summer soul food and sud segment featuring our Southern sister, Jenny McCormick of Southern Sisters Radio and Aaron, the beer guy, Williams. We're talking baby back ribs and the perfect beer pairing. This is Eddie Mayfield with EMA. That's E-M-A, I-N-C dot net. I'm in Wins World and we love it. I'm Amber Berry with Crazy Healthy Radio. Come visit me at Westside Yoga on Hal Mill Road in the month of September. And your first week is free for new students. It's National Yoga Month, and we would love to meet you on the mat. I'm in Wen's World, and I love it. Hey, everybody. This is Jenny McCormick Earhart inviting you to join me every Saturday at 1 o'clock on the Southern Sisters Radio Show, the show for Southern women and the men who adore us. We talk about everything from life in the South to food in the South to romance in the South. So hit me up at my website, southernsistershome.com, or follow me on Facebook. I'm in Wen's World, and I love it. Baby back ribs. Barbecue sauce. Jenny, how you doing? I'm, good. I'm doing great. Awesome. Are we on the air? We're on air. I have a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> got him. Another one. Yeah, you got me. But we are back with the Southern sister, Mrs. Jenny McCormick. Mm-hmm. SouthernSistersHome.com. That's right. Uh, connect with her on Facebook also. Labor Day is approaching, so mm-hmm. come Labor Day, that means football time. Weekends are going to be saturated with hot mm-hmm. grills, mm-hmm. cold beers, mm-hmm. and this week I am uber excited about the recipe that you brought in. Right. Well, what's not to love? Well, you know, actually, you know, this Saturday is National Baby Back Ribs Day, Oof. so I don't need an, a holiday to celebrate baby back ribs. They're kind of a part of my staple diet. You know what I'm saying? Cool. But we've got a great one. And so for those of you that are watching football and you got to start the process earlier in the day, my ultimate nine hour barbecue ribs are to die for. They are. Mm. And they're, they're so easy because you pop them in the oven and you literally don't do anything for nine hours. Other than I guess. <laughs> That's right at my alley. Otherwise, I guess you can drink a little beer and watch a little football. Right? Yeah. It is a, a phenomenal sauce. Guys, the, 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 the trick is in the sauce. That's where the magic is. And it is a wonderful melding of savory and sweet flavors. You're going to some garlic and onions, a little bit of butter, some ketchup or chili sauce, a little brown sugar to sweeten it up. I put a little spicy horseradish mustard in mine. Oh, I love horseradish. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And a little dark corn syrup because after all, we are in the South. You know, a little Cairo corn syrup, shall we say. <laughs> now, the proportions for all of these will be on my website, southernsistershome.com. Just click on the blob. Look at my ultimate nine-hour barbecue ribs recipe. You'll get all the exact proportions. But we're not done. We need honey, right? Of course we do. We need a little apple cider vinegar. We need, brace yourself now, Joey, 
Pineapple juice. I just fell out my chair. I know, right? Right? Is it crazy? We are talking crazy talk here. Pineapple juice in my barbecue sauce. A little Worcestershire sauce, some chili powder. I'm kind of in love lately with the hot chili powder. Oh, I love yeah. the chili powder. Yeah. Spice it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. About a tablespoon of salt, maybe a little shake of cayenne, and some black pepper. Now, what you're going to do in a saucepan is you're going to melt the butter, cook the garlic and the onion until soft, and then add all the remaining ingredients. You're going to bring it to a boil, then reduce the heat. And simmer it for about 30 minutes, right? In the meantime, those baby back ribs, you're going to layer them in a pan, pour the sauce over, but reserve some of the sauce because you're going to want to look, you know, you're going to want something to sop later, yeah, right? Of course, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And you pop those babies into, get this, a 190 degree oven. That's it for nine hours. Wow. Log about hour three or four. All the dogs in the neighborhood are going to be lined up on your front porch because they're going to smell the, <laughs> the, 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 the fragrance. The aroma from these ribs is going to be just sort of wafting across your uh, across your neighborhood. So these are these are outstanding. Approaching mm. fall, but it's never too late for baby back ribs. Baby back ribs. I want my baby back, baby back. I was hoping that you pull out that song. Yeah, I know. And I as Jenny sing. mentioned, you got to check out her website, southernsistershome.com, and you got a radio show. I do. As a most, very coincidentally, named the Southern Sisters Radio Show. The show for Southern women and the men who adore us, Saturdays at 1 o'clock on 590. And always on SoundCloud, On Demand 365, all the time. Always. Southern Sisters Radio. Mm. Jenny. You are amazing, and I cannot oh, wait to you. dive into some ribs. Have a great Labor Day weekend. We're getting boozy with the beer guy, Aaron and the Wens, right here in Wens World. Yep, back in Wens World, getting boozy with the beer guy, Aaron Williams. Aaron, welcome back to Wens World. It's always good to be here, Joey. Oh, yeah. You know, we got some ribs on the grill this weekend. Yeah, we so do. what's a good pairing with those baby back ribs? Well, here's the deal. You know, of course, it's the t- a typical or unofficial end of the summertime season and heading into fall. Mm. and You've probably already noticed over the past couple of weeks that uh, you've seen a lot of Oktoberfest beers and a lot of pumpkin beers and a lot of those fall beers. It's too early. I, you know what? I'm right there with you. It's like, you know, them putting Christmas decorations up now. It's like, you know what? <laughs> Give me a couple of weeks. I, I want to at least think about wearing a sweatshirt before I can start really indulging myself yeah. in some of the great Oktoberfest beers out there. But uh, with ribs, uh, really, there's really no better uh, pairing than to have a good Oktoberfest style. Now, Oktoberfest styles are usually going to be really malt forward. They're 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 crisp. They're not bitter, uh, so they're really going to be able to cut kind of the greasiness of the ribs, but still give you a nice a malt backbone, a nice little sweetness that goes with the uh, the smoky and sweet of the barbecue ribs. So. I would suggest a couple of things. Of course, the most iconic one and the easiest one you can find anywhere is going to be the Sam Adams Oktoberfest. Right. I mean, we've already seen that for about a month already. So that's definitely, but I mean, it's not necessarily a bad beer. It's a great beer. So uh, so if you've got, if you're in a pinch, go to the store, grab a Sam Adams Oktoberfest. You can't go wrong. Sierra Nevada also makes a great Oktoberfest as well. So uh, they they do a really good job. And also, you know, of course, you can't go wrong with some of the ones actually in Germany that make Oktoberfest beers. Uh, Paul Honor makes a good Oktoberfest Meritzen beer, which I would suggest as well. However... We do have a great local option, too. So uh, Red Hair uh, makes a, it's what's called a Hassenpfeffer Oktoberfest. And it's a black box with a brown labeling on it. So you check that out. Uh, Red Hair, again, probably one of the better Oktoberfests I've had, actually. They do a really nice job. And they're nice. from Marietta, so they're local, which is good. You can follow the Beer Guys at Beer Guys Radio on Twitter. And, of course, Aaron and his partner, Tim, Beer Guys Radio, every single Saturday, AM 920, The Answer, at noon. Aaron, always a pleasure to have you in Wins World. Cheers. Cheers, brother. Friends, we're a hop, skip, and a jump away from what's grinding the voice's gears. And right after that, your brain on sex with author and neuroscientist Kate Sukel. Stick with us. Right. This is Dennis Prager, and I am in Wen's World, and I love it. The Out of Control Atlanta Traffic Watch. Oh, it is out of control, but who is in control of giving you the very latest and greatest all things traffic? The voice of Atlanta traffic himself, Mr. Chris Monroe. Loving it. How are you, man? Doing great, man. I am fantastic. Labor Day weekend. What to anticipate on the roadways? At least they're not going to be doing big construction projects over Labor Day, which Mm -hmm. is nice. So GDOT's going to be suspending all of that. But, you know, I was going up. And our foundation, we just got a little office up in Marietta, very close to the Big Chicken. So I decided, well, I'll just go up 41 from the station the other day. Right. A lot of folks are concerned about what the Brave Stadium and all the traffic's going to do. Dude, it took me an hour 
to get from Buckhead to Marietta on what? 41 North. I mean, it's like 50 minutes because of the construction and the traffic. I mean, it was every light sit at for like 12 minutes. I mean, it's just absolute craziness. So that's out of control. Cobb Parkway, it's done. It's it's the Cumberland District over there, the New Brave Stadium. Mm. Uh, you're going to have to park and walk because you're not going to. It's going to be like a little mini New York right there. Oh, geez. which is already bad enough. So. It really is. What else can we anticipate? Anything going on on the uh, east or west side, 20, any of that stuff, downtown connector? Not or? this weekend, at least. Thank God. So maybe not as out of control, but you know what will be out of control is all that traffic on 75 through where they're uh, putting the express lane in down at McDonough. Oh, the south side. The south side. Oh, my god. That gosh. south expressway between Morrow, McDonough, and down into like almost Macon. That whole stretch of 75 will be jammed pretty much this whole weekend with uh, holiday traffic. And you know... The Smokies, GSP, going to be out in the big blue full force. Keep it nine over, folks. Nine over. P's and Q's, baby. That's what you got to do. You know, Chris, you wear some broad shoulders, but every now and then I get the sense that, you know, they're a little tight. You got a lot on them. Yeah. So what's been grinding Monroe's gear? <laughs> you ever do that, man? You're grinding your gears and you're learning to drive a stick shift. Well, that's what happens uh, in my daily life. And uh, a new segment here that I'm proud to introduce right here on Winds World. What grinds my gears with the voice of Atlanta traffic? One of the things that grinds my gears is uh, automatic sensor toilet paper and, uh, you know, hand towel dispensers. Oh, okay. In the restrooms. Yeah, you're not alone. You know what I'm talking about? I know exactly you what you're talking in, about. Okay, you've washed your hands, you've gone to the bathroom, and here you are waving your hands in front of that stupid thing like an idiot trying to get a paper towel to come out because you want to dry your hands. That really grinds my gears. So you're supposed to wash your hands in the bathroom. This is what this is what we've gone down to, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just carry a jug of hand sanitizer with me because I figured it out. You're touching the dang sink, right? Yeah. Before you wash your hands, and you're touching it after, unless you have one of those motion activated ones, and they don't work half the time. And then you don't get any paper towels. Then you got to wipe your hands on your pants. Yeah. yeah. So I just figure, why even bother? Just use hand sanitizer. Well, that's true. And it's going to be a good segment because I have got a long list, a long list of things, Joey, that grind my gears. And, I, and we got that for Family Guy, so I mean, I didn't come up with it. That's that's Peter Griffin. Yeah, uh, please, Seth MacFarlane, no lawsuits. Yeah, I know, right? Because the show is uh, very poor. <laughs> 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 Thanks for your time, Chris. Right, the man. voice of Atlanta traffic on Twitter. On Twitter at Atlanta traffic. And don't forget to check out my uh, music nonprofit, the Gift of Music Foundation. Uh, it's uh, easy to find, giftofmusic.org. We help kids with uh, instruments and grants and scholarships, those that can't afford them, and many programs that are in need of help, too, because of all the cuts in arts funding. So check us out. We'd love uh, donated instruments and uh, any help you can give us. Again, giftofmusic.org. Scholar and a gentleman, Mr. Chris Monroe, here in Winsworth. Thank you, brother. Have a good holiday weekend. You, too. Here's the Bookie Bookie Bugle Bar of Company B. Yes, back in Wen's World, and my next guest has no problem tackling the taboo. Author of the book, This Is Your Brain on Sex, The Science Behind the Search for Love. Author and neuroscientist, Kate Suko. Welcome back to Wen's World, Kate. How are you? I am well. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Doing fantastic. Kate is online, katesuckel.com, and that's K-A-Y-T-S-U-K-E-L, and of course on Twitter, at Kate Suckel. So last time we chatted about epigenetics, a.k.a. how much of this is my parents' or grandparents' fault, and this week I want to get into chapter five of your book, and the chapter is titled, Our Primates, Ourselves, and in parentheses, or Why We Are Not Slaves to our hormones. So, right. so fascinating. <laughs> this chapter really touches on a lot of points. But the first thing I wanted to know from the expert here, Kate Suckel, is why is it that hormones control sexual behavior in some species, but play more of a moderator role in others? Well, so some of that has to do with our big, highly evolved frontal lobes, right? When we're talking about, um, you know, sort of rodents or, or smaller mammals, you know, what you see like with baboons, right? If they're ovulating, their butt turns red. Hmm. Um, it's a signal that everybody else, just that one change in hormones that they are fertile, you know, really controls whether or not they're going to have sex and, of course, whether or not somebody's going to approach them. Now, when you're going out in the club, 
your butt is not turning red. So even though, you know, our, you know, we are only reproductively viable, you know, once a month as women, you know, there aren't a lot of outer signals and our behavior has kind of come away from that. So it really has a lot to do with brain changes. Now, that said, there have been studies that suggest that there are, you know, even though our butts aren't turning red, there are other little things that might be changing. Women who are ovulating tend to dress more provocatively. They're more likely to ask a guy to dance. And actually strippers who are ovulating tend to make more tips those nights. How about that? Yeah, but uh, again, no big red baboon butt, which is probably good because I don't know if that's such a turn on anymore. Speaking of the male-female dynamic, testosterone and estrogen are pretty similar. They're just an enzyme apart. That is correct. So all of us, uh, have both estrogen and testosterone. And in fact, they convert into one another with an enzyme called aromatase. And so, you know, so often we think testosterone, it's all about being manly. But women, you know, they don't have as much testosterone, but they have quite a bit of it in their bodies as well. Um, and in fact, you know, that, that can convert into, into estrogen. So they're pretty similar. Um, they both are neurochemicals, which means both estrogen and testosterone can act as neurochemicals and, and, you know, cleave to receptors and change brain functions, which I think is really important as well. Certainly explains uh, why PMS is not just a thing that women made up to punish you men. Uh, <laughs> there are really changes to the mood areas of the brain um, to make us, you know, again, more re reproductively viable. There's so much stuff that's going on just for sex to happen in the brain, and which is, is kind of fascinating in its own right. And it, a lot of it's unconscious, but that doesn't mean that it's inviolate. Human beings can be pretty modest when the topic of sex comes up. Few people really want to get into the details of it, and rightfully so, right? It's a very private act. So scientists have kind of leaned toward our primate friend, and in this case, a monkey named Casanova at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center. So... Mm -hmm. What can we take away about sexual behavior and motivation from these experiments with our friend Casanova? Well, so your keys is right there at Emory University in your backyard, by the way. So a lot of fascinating research being done right there in Atlanta. Um, love me some ATL for that work. But, you know, here's the thing. We talk about our animal instincts and how we can't deny them. Mm -hmm. Even with an animal like Casanova, and in this case in the book, you know, this was a, a, a male primate that had been introduced to the pack, and mm -hmm. he was trying to figure out what was going on. He had just been introduced. He was kind of young, and as soon as he ends up in the pen, females start propositioning him for sex. But he doesn't know the social order yet. He doesn't know what the consequences would be or who these females are if they're paired up with somebody else. Mm. And so even though he basically has, you know, the equivalent of a monkey hoochie mama shaking her butt in his <laughs> face saying, come on, you can have it, you know, he's waiting it out. Even his frontal lobes are telling him, wait a minute, mm. sex would be great, but I need to get the lay of the land first. I need to see how this is going to influence me socially, uh, how this might change the dynamic of the group, what's going on. And if a monkey can do it, that means even you can, no matter how hot that woman may be at the club or at the office or whatever else. You always have the power to take a step back and say, no. You may not always want to, but you always have the power to. So people who say that they can't help cheating, it's some kind of, especially a male imperative, <laughs> you, you can't deny, you know, Mother Nature, right. eh, even a monkey can manage it. So even if the butt turns red, sometimes we have to stop and think about the consequences of what exactly. we're doing. Exactly. We may like a red <laughs> butt, but sometimes, you know, engaging in uh, that red butt action means that we're going to be in hot water later. Ooh, that's so true. And as we wrap things up, last question. In your opinion, how much does society impact our hormones? Oh, well, I, that's another question that's hard to answer because we're learning being in groups can change our hormones, being in proximity of other people. You know, and a really interesting fact for me is, uh, you know, age of, of when a girl starts her period um, can be altered by the fact uh, whether or not she lives with an unrelated male. She, she may start her period earlier than she would otherwise. Wow. So we, we see that, you know, we're, we're socially connected, but we're also biologically connected human beings. And so we're finding our environments and the situations that we're in really do change um, when and where our hormones act up. Um, and we're only beginning to scratch the surface of it from a neuroscientific perspective. Kate Suckel's never afraid to tackle that taboo. And next time we get together, I want to talk about 
the his and hers, right? So the difference is the age old question, what makes us so different from each other, males and females? Author Kate Sukel here in Wen's World, found online, katesukel.com. Again, K A Y T S U K E L. And of course, at Kate Sukel on Twitter. Kate, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. Friends, radio legend Larry W A C H S, right after this break. Time now for Sports Talk with Griffin Adkins. As a 49ers fan, how do you feel about Colin Kaepernick right now? Yes, I am a 49ers fan, and I am so depressed about Colin Kaepernick, let alone all the protest stuff. Uh, You know, there's rumors that the guy has um, switched religions. He confirmed yesterday that he's a vegan. His whole worldview has changed. But that kind of bothers me but what bothers me more is that this guy just suddenly stinks at football he's terrible he probably won't even play this season and it's so sad i look back uh, on my twitter feed of old pictures of him and jim harbaugh hugging and giving each other high fives playing in the super bowl playing in nfc championship games and that was only three or four years ago, but it seems like it was at least a decade ago. I'm crying, man. I'm looking back at those pictures, and there's tears rolling down my cheeks. It's it's sad. What's become of what Ron Jaworski said was the greatest quarterback to ever play the game, or at least he had potential to be that. And now look at him. The guy weighs less than I do. He can't throw anymore. His judgment in all areas of life seems to be off. It's, it's just sad. This has been Griffin Adkins with your sports report. This is Larry WACHS of the world famous WACHS Modcast, Atlanta's number one smartphone radio show on iTunes and Google Play. But that's nothing compared to Wen's World. So you saw the Colin Kaepernick story. Yes, and I would like to thank him. I want to thank him for making us aware of the African American situation in America. For without Colin Kaepernick, how would we know that African Americans have suffered greatly in America over the past 200 some years? While us, the rest of us, are having parties and living the high life, it turns out, and I did not know this, uh, Colin Kaepernick graciously pointed this out to us uh, last week, and I thank him that African Americans, it turns out, have not been privy to as much uh, party privilege as the rest of us. So. I want to thank him uh, for that. Let me ask you something. Yeah. Do you, uh, what is what was your reaction to uh, Colin Kaepernick's stance, as muddled and as uh, nonsensical as it may be? My initial reaction was that which has been shared on social media. It was uh, initially I was just shocked. I was shocked and leaning what, what towards. What were you pissed. shocked about? What what shocked you about Colin Kaepernick? What shot you that a guy with a Phil Collins motto across his chest <laughs> uh, could possibly uh, come up with? I just didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming from Colin Kaepernick. You know, he was raised by white parents. Mm-hmm. You know, he you thought he was an all American guy. Well, yeah, because he hasn't given me any reason to believe otherwise. Mm-hmm. And apparently this isn't the first time this has happened, but just the first time it's been noticed. Why does anybody care what Colin Kaepernick thinks about America. Let me why do you care what Colin Kaepernick thinks about America and the flag and everything else? Why does anyone care? Joey, why do you care what Colin Kaepernick thinks about anything? I think America cares what athletes and actors think nowadays. Well, yeah, that's evident, but why? Their star power, their their platform. I think money speaks now. If you have money, you're taken more seriously. It's money. Yeah. Like people would care about what Kim Kardashian says, even though she's a nitwit. I don't care about what Car- Kim Kardashian says. Well, I find the you- less I care about what Colin Kaepernick thinks of anything, the better off I am. It's just a waste of time. But what if he's saying the right things? I don't. He did say some of the right things. He said Hillary Clinton should be in jail. I still don't care what he thinks. Right. Because he's not going to put her in jail. He don't have any solutions. I, what I'm looking for from a guy, from anybody who has an opinion, is like, all right, you point out a problem. That's a dime a dozen. Why don't you raise your game and give us some solutions? What's happening with Colin Kaepernick is, again, sad. Like Tom Brady's haircut, we're seeing an emasculation mm. before our very eyes. And who who's getting the cash? His Egyptian DJ girlfriend. 
who's put all this nonsense into his head, and they're going to steal him blind, this kid, Colin Kaepernick, these, uh, his Egyptian DJ girlfriend. She's pretty hot, but, you know, she's a, she's a money grubber, just like all the women. Wow, she's pretty. Yeah, she's pretty, but Beautiful. she's a manipulator. She's a manipulator. She's manipulating. That's what I heard. Did you hear? That's what I heard, that, she, that he has some uh, Egyptian DJ. So, you know, what we're seeing here is that, um, you know, they've radicalized an NFL quarterback now. This chick has radicalized an NFL quarterback for cash. That's what's going on here. That's what Prince called control. Yeah, he has no control over the mm-hmm. none. He's letting the control him. Yep. But I mean, can you blame him? <laughs> I mean, she's gorgeous. Well, he's stupid. Yeah, so I expect this. <laughs> you know, I knew he was stupid going in, so it doesn't shock me that he would say something stupid. I'm going to sit down and and not respect the flag. And mm-hmm. I say, like, I don't care. The flag doesn't care about you, Colin. So, I, and the country doesn't really care. You're a third string overweight quarterback. And by the way, Let's not uh, let's not let this go unnoticed that he is an overpaid third string quarterback uh, on a team that is going nowhere. Right. And football is not in the cards uh, for him very long. He's got to find another line of work, which is, you know, in this case, uh, he's looking into professional victimization (laughs) as his way to make a Hey, it's lucrative. It is. He's betting that on November 8th, things won't change. Hey, Jesse Jackson's got to die sometime. That's right. That's right. You got to find some substitutes. You got to find a farm team. You know, the the uh, jihadists, the the Black Panthers and the uh, Muslims are looking for uh you know, they need a, a farm club. He's in AAA right now. And when his commitment to the 49ers ends probably in a few weeks under Chip Kelly's uh, ridiculous offense. Oh, so terrible. That's another thing. It's like if I'm Colin Kaepernick, uh, put yourself in his shoes. This is how we understand people. We put okay. the, ourselves in their shoes. Right. Okay, you're Colin Kaepernick. You, you sucked before Chip Kelly, and now Chip Kelly comes in with his ridiculous offense that can't work in the pros because no pro wants to run a play every 20 seconds. Right. They just don't want to. Right. <laughs> College athletes do because they have to. They're, try, they're eager to succeed. They're hungry. They're young. Plus, college athletes have, also have an advantage over the pro athlete in running the Chip Kelly stupid uh, gas your players offense, which is college players don't have the access to money, Women, booze, and drugs like the pro athletes do. The pro, no pro athlete in their right mind, now that they got the money, is going to run a play every 20 seconds. It can, it, that's why the offense doesn't work. As long as they have access to women, booze, and drugs, they're not going to be. You got to make choices. You got to build your offense around what you have, not what you wish you had. You have to build your offense around the fact that all pro players are millionaires who have easy access to women, drugs, and booze. Therefore, they're not designed to sprint 60 times a day. Nobody is, but Usain Bolt is not built for that. But football players certainly are, and that's why that offense crashed and burned in Philadelphia. And it will in San Francisco because he has less personnel. Carlos Hyde is not what DeMarco Murray, he hasn't come close. I don't know what's going to happen to DeMarco Murray now, but up until that point... It was, it was hands down not a not a contest. Well, you can't start a running back in the pistol position and expect him to outsmart the quickest defensive ends in the world. They're smart. They right. know. Right. Even last year, Josh Huff called Chip Kelly's playbook out. He said the defense knows what we're doing, and he got in trouble for it. But everybody that knows anything about football that's even watching it it's knew absurd. what was happening. It's it's absurd. Yeah, pro football is not a track meet. Exactly. It's just not, and you're going to gas out your players. And meanwhile, Chip Kelly looks like he ate an elephant. And why would he be inspire these players to change their diet and retool their workouts in order to get this offense up and running? They would have a chance if it was like a, a fit-looking guy like Adam Gase or one of these other young young bucks, but not Chip Kelly. He's a fat guy. Or bring Harbaugh back. The whole thing with that was the disagreement between him and Kaepernick. He was a great coach. I mean, he led him to the playoffs like three years in a row. And then 2012, that's when Kaepernick shined, but it was under the leadership of Harbaugh. That's because Harbaugh didn't have this stupid offense, but also right. because at the time with Harbaugh, Colin Kaepernick did not have this uh, Egyptian DJ <laughs> flashing her cooter around to get uh, money from her Muslim organizers. That's what she's doing. She's renting herself out. She gets a chip. Listen, and let me ask you something. If she were yeah. a real Muslim woman, would she be uncovered? Would her head be uncovered? No, she'd be wearing the burkini. That's right. If she were a real Muslim woman, would she be flapping her lips and talking trash about America all the time. No. No, she would let her husband do that because right. that's what you're supposed to do as a true Muslim woman. Right. Would this, uh, if she were a true Muslim woman, would she be 
whoring around with a, a, a stupid uh, dumb jock. No. No, of course not. Of course not. That's the tell right there. You can tell where she's coming from because she makes her money being the, the woman that the men in the Muslim organizations allow her to be that way so they can use her as a lure to people like Colin Kaepernick. Sometimes it's just cool to shoot the breeze, so let's get off topic for a minute, Amber Berry. But first, a sip out of the Yeti. Yetis rule the world. They really do, and I've been... Why are people wearing Yeti hats? Like, what's up with the Yeti hat thing? I think the Yeti hats and the Yeti... I have no desire to wear a Yeti hat. Yeah, I mean, unless you're a Yeti, like the one from the Wampa from Star Wars who got his... (laughs) You got sliced up by Skywalker in that cave. Yeah. I think if you aren't that individual, if you have a Yeti hat or a sticker on your car, you are officially d- in my opinion. <laughs> because it's almost it's almost too trendy. I don't jump on trends. I'm a late adopter. So first That's why we haven't gotten you into yoga yet. That's right. And I'm also But you're coming, right? I'm not very bendy. I strain myself easily, which is a good reason. You know, everybody says that. Like everybody believes that. And it's just one of those things where you have to trust the struggle because it's it's you'll find your way. Well, I have purchased a full body royal blue spandex suit. I'm thinking about. That sounds more like a Halloween costume than a workout <laughs> outfit. <laughs> it Paint is your kind face of spooky. blue, get some hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> or one of those uh, biker helmets with a mohawk on top. I'm like, yeah. that's not your real hair. You Nobody poser. should wear full body suits, like even women, like. Don't you don't know. think unless, so? Unless you've got like a Victoria's Secret figure, maybe. But are you are you saying that I don't obnoxious. have the, the secrets out? I guess there's no more secret here. <laughs> I just don't want to see it. I got, I got you <laughs> on anybody on anybody. Like, but you know, I you know, I'm I you know, I wear my yoga pants everywhere, and so I guess it's probably not that much different. <laughs> no, and you know what I love about yoga pants? I call yoga pants and leggings. Is that how you or is it leggings? Is there a G? Hey. After the GG. I think it depends on whether you're in the South or not. All right. Let's pretend we're in the South. Okay. Okay. So I think leggings are (laughs) the perfect attire for any season. And I call fall and winter Han Solo season because you always see the girls with their leggings on and their tall brown boots, just like Han Solo from Star Wars. I love it. I'm thinking that that might be what you are for Halloween. I think you need to be Luke Skywalker. I think I have... Obi-Wan. Yeah, well, oh man, Obi-Wan is a G. Like, I can't live up to the knowledge, that guy. Like, he is literally... But if you came and did yoga with me, you could. I could. And that was off topic with Amber Berry. (laughs) Now, I'm going to try and get on topic here because I've wasted enough of her time. We are with Wen's World's Sensei. The great Amber Berry of at Crazy Healthy on Twitter and CrazyHealthyAmber.com. Welcome back to Wen's World, Amber. How are you? Thank you. I am fantastic. I feel very energized today. I got up and ran and then did an ab workout. They call it Six Pack Promise. It's an it's an app designed by That's this. A great brand name. It, it well, it's it's only a promise if you commit, right? And so the promise is if you'll do these exercises and exercise discipline in the kitchen, then you will have a six pack. And the problem I have is I enjoy too many foods that keep the old winter coat on. You know, one of the things that is not commonly understood is that what you're calling curiosity can actually be craving. Mm -hmm. And that craving comes from imbalance in the body. And Ayurveda teaches that the body needs six different tastes or flavors every day to have a complete nutritional profile. And it's really amazing, the science behind it, and to understand that these cravings, maybe, do you crave sweet or salty? I crave both. Okay, so <laughs> so Ayurveda teaches that if you're craving sweet foods, that you can counteract a sweet craving with a bitter food or a pungent food or a sour food. And so instead of eating a bowl of ice cream, Mm -hmm. you could eat something, eat some spicy food, you know, and that would rid you of your craving. And it's something that's actually worked for me. Like when I have a sugar craving, I eat something bitter. Either I'll eat a salad or I'll eat a grapefruit. And so when people say that they're curious or they can't control their eating habits, I always wonder what's behind that. Like, mm. is it more of an imbalance in the diet than actually the person's lack of, of 
control. Well, we had uh, Margaret Schwenke on earlier, and she's our holistic nutritionist, and she shared a lot of insight into why people have these cravings and whether it's actually, am I really craving the food or is there an issue going on that I'm using the food as a means to combat this issue rather than actually dealing with the problem at hand? This kind of mirrors that and complements that. Well, and it's, it's so interesting because the way we are taught to think about it in the Western world leads to a lot of self-judgment, mm-hmm. a lot of feeling of inadequacy. Why can't I control myself? Why mm-hmm. can't I stop eating all the sugar? And the universal truth is that It has more to do with psychology and how our brain works. And so and so we're in this spiral of feeling bad about ourselves. But if we're curious about what it really comes from, then we can give ourselves grace and understand, feel compassion for ourselves. It's not what we think it is. And there's a different way to go about solving the problem. Yeah. You know, the struggle is real. So they say, yeah, it's it's about what you invest in. And so if you're consistently investing in a perfect appearance, it's an unattainable goal. Yeah. And we're never going to look perfect. And the question is, at what point are you satisfied? But instead, if you invest in living a balanced life, having an appropriate amount of work and play, an appropriate amount of struggle and joy, And trying to seek the truth, be curious about what's really happening here, because so often our mind tells us that a scenario is one thing when the truth behind what's happening is something very different. And so if you invest in asking questions that lead you closer to the universal truth, then you're prioritizing your own joy. And that's something that's sustainable for a lifetime, whereas our appearance is fleeting. And that's what makes people beautiful. The most beautiful people I know are the people who shine from the inside out. And it's not the model walking down the catwalk. It's the people who are just happy to be here, happy to be in the presence of friends. With Amber Berry at Crazy Healthy on Twitter and, of course, CrazyHealthyAmber.com. We're slaves to this on-demand society, right? Like you mentioned before, the instant gratification. And when it comes to food, we have all these quick options, right? There's a Wendy's. There's a Taco Bell. And so when these things happen, we're like, oh, I got a buck five. I can grab a quick double cheeseburger. I've gotten to the place where I would rather buy something at Whole Foods and forego 10 other things because I know that it's bringing me closer to my goal. So that's that's a whole nother conversation. It's about what we value. Mm. Yeah, it's just being the witness to your thoughts and how often you're having that conversation with yourself. And once in a while, if you want a dollar cheeseburger, then, you know, once in a while. But if you're doing it every day, like I did in college, like I had a bad McDonald's habit. Oh, I love it. We talked about the Big Mac before. Yeah. So something about it. Big Mac and Dr. Pepper. Oh, and but I was living in a world where that was okay. The people around me were doing similar things. And I never stopped asking myself, what I valued and I was just relying on what everyone else around me was doing. And that's why I think this practice of yoga is so important because it makes you more invested in who you are and what you believe. And it changes your brain. Like Mm. it actually changes your brain to do this practice and you start wanting different foods and you stop wanting things that make you feel bad. You become more sensitive to things that make you feel bad. And you just don't want that stuff anymore. Wen's World's very own sensei, Mrs. Amber Berry of Westside Yoga, right here in Atlanta off of Howell Mill Road. Connect on Twitter at Crazy Healthy. And her website has all the info, the details, upcoming events, so on and so forth. CrazyHealthyAmber.com. Amber, as always, it is literally a pleasure to have you in Wen's World. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Joey. It's awesome to be here. In Wen's World with eating psychology counselor, Mrs. Margaret Schwanke. Welcome back, Margaret. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Fantastic. You know, last week we talked about the transaction that happens between the plate and my big fat mouth. So, hashtag why intimins why. Yes. There's something emotional that happens in my brain when I have that craving. And so I've always kind of wondered why does that happen and possibly the steps that I can take to alleviate that pressure and make the right decision. Yeah, I think that's right. I think a lot of us have cravings. And I think the interesting perspective here is to realize that an emotional craving is separate from a physical craving. 
emotional hunger is different than physical hunger. And so in order to start to understand and to, to really master our own nutrition, we also have to master our emotional process. So let's say, take an average day in the world of the winds here. Yes. I'm at the grocery store. Let's say that I just got in a huge fight with somebody. Yeah. So the need there would to actually be to call them and make things right. But the donuts are so much cheaper and easier to deal with. Yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. I think that, that you know, you're already maybe like three steps ahead by recognizing that what you're really desiring is to call that person and to make amends. I think a lot of us are still maybe not clear on that. A lot of us are just knowing and feeling that we want the donuts, haven't yet worked backwards or done the deeper dive to understand that like what's really happening is something in our emotional world and that you're having a disconnection from your peace, right? You're, right. you're, you're really, you've had a, a disagreement or a fight or something that's causing you to be dissatisfied. And so that's, I think the first step then is to realize that there is something going on emotionally that's different than your desire to have sugar or donuts or whatever that is. So then at that point, how do I separate the emotion from the decision? Allowing yourself to go through the emotional process of, of feeling whatever the emotion is. Oh, okay. Now I recognize that I'm really upset because I had a fight with my wife or my, you know, son or whomever. There's something going on for me emotionally. And so I get to separate those two things and I don't have to feed the emotional need with a physical food. You know, and, and it's fine, whatever choice we want to make that we're going to be OK with. Right. So if we choose the donuts, OK, that's fine. As long as you're doing that from a conscious place. Right. Because if we're wow. choosing the donut okay. from a, an emotional need and then we scarf down half a box of donuts and then later, like one hour later, probably feeling like, oh, my gosh, guilt and shame about that decision. I wish I hadn't done that and still left with the pain from the argument. So it didn't fix the problem. And it also made you feel worse. So drawing consciousness to that analyzation, right, of the emotion versus the physical, the, the food is where you get to separate those two things and figure out what it is that you actually need in that moment. Wow. So how do you help people get to that place? Mindfulness, as we've talked about, is really the first doorway to understanding that first and foremost, you know, I, I, there's something here for me to look at. There's a there's a deeper question here for me to look at. And it's through looking at those cravings. I mean, people come to me and say, OK, I, I, I have cravings. I, I'm craving this or that or the other thing. And it's it's through a conversation about, OK, well, maybe that is real. Maybe you're physically addicted to sugar. And so therefore you need to possibly go through a sugar detox in order to be able to reclaim your choice around food. Hmm. But if it's not, if you don't have symptoms of being addicted to sugar, then what's really going on? Wow. Yeah. So being an eating psychology counselor What's the next step? So once you, you've addressed there's something else going on here, mm -hmm. what do you find people do at that point? Is there a lot of deflection at that point? Is there a lot of denial? And how do you address the inevitable resistance that comes with that initial blow? This is a very personal process. And so we don't even have to go necessarily yet across the boundary to the other person and who's to blame for what and who's doing what, right? This is more about my personal decisions, right? As an eater and as someone who wants to take control of my eating. So if there are things in my life that are contributing to my lack of control around this particular area of my life, right? There, the, the first recognition is is just that right yeah. there, there, there are other things happening here and there's a reason that I'm eating this way and it's not because of the food. Right. So then it becomes a personal pref or personal choice, right? Like, so, so I get to take some deep breaths and feel the upset that came from the argument and not have to feed that with food. Wow. That's so huge. It seems like such a, a simple thing, but sometimes uh, actually a lot of times in life, the simplest things are the hardest things to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But Margaret Schwenke of MargaretSchwenke.com can help out with that. She is a certified eating psychology counselor and a holistic nutritionist. And she can be found at MargaretSchwenke.com. M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T-S-C-H-W-E-N-K-E.com. Margaret, always a pleasure to have you in One's World. Thank you very much. 
My friend, you have made it to the very end of this week's edition of Wens World. Hey, hit me up on Twitter at Wens World Radio. Also at producer underscore Joey. You follow me, I'll follow you back. You can also email the show WensWorldRadio at gmail.com and producer Joey1981 at gmail.com. We'll talk to you next time. Take care. Excellent! You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign.